Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, that's the post-lunch energy that we need. Uh, so um, right before lunch, we all got, I hopefully you are as fired up as I was about the new technologies coming out of the startup community surrounding MIT. Um, all of the uh, solutions, some of which are uh, mechanical, some chemical, some information technological. Um, and it's so exciting to see those new technologies emerging and getting uh, from the laboratory bench to the place where they're starting to become commercially deployable and they're here looking for, for partnerships. Um, but of course, bringing new technologies to market and helping them realize their transformative potential is, it is not automatic. Um, it, uh, it, it, takes, it takes real work and there are real challenges and barriers to overcome in, uh, in, bringing, in, in bringing new technologies in, into the real world. So we're gonna have a, a panel today which is aimed at being a little bit of a reality check, um, an exploration of what does it take to actually bring technologies to market, to have them achieve their impact, um, what kind of risks do we have to manage along the way, what kind of barriers do we have to over, over, overcome. Um, so we have a fantastic panel to help us explore this topic uh, today, um, and I'll just, uh, uh, invite each of them to, to, to the stage. Um, starting with Wei Kai. Um, Wei is the Chief Technology Officer for Technip Energies, um, which you'll get to hear more about in a moment. Welcome. And uh, have you sit there, I'll, I'll take this, this first chair and you can grab that one, great. Um, we have Mike Witt, who is Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer for Northrop Grumman in the aerospace and defense industry. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Cheers. And we have Jerry Gupta, who is the head of property and casualty research for the Swiss Reinsurance Institute. Welcome, Jerry. Cheers. <clears throat> There's a little sound coming up through the front, like some voice that I, it's a, I'm not sure where it's coming from. It's a little distracting. If we could eliminate that, I'd, I'd love that. Uh, first a bit about where you sit, what is your vantage point on this whole landscape of uh, sustainability and technologies? Any way you want to start? Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, MIT, uh, for uh, hosting this event. Very exciting morning uh, so far. So where Technip Energy stand in sustainability? Basically, we are the company handling molecules and electrons. So probably more molecules than electrons. Molecule meaning energy, right? You start with, uh, now it's uh, fossil fuel, but uh, we are handling hydrogen, uh, CO2, and figuring out a way how to turn that into the future of the materials that we need. Uh, for example, polymers and materials. So we are, we built in the past hydrogen plants, uh, ethylene plants, uh, working with refineries. So how do we turn those plants to be sustainable? And also circularity. So there are other uh, uh, sustainable or renewable uh, electrons, for example, floating offshore wind. So those are the areas I just touched that are very relevant to this, uh, this uh, conference. Mm, great. And in terms of where you sit in the value chain, you're, you, you guys are sort of an engineering, design, construction, commissioning yeah. firm. Thank you for reminding us. So we are uh, basically is scaling up. Uh, building the plants, like I said, right? Building the facilities that make things happen. So we are, this is ex excellent, uh, excellent uh, opportunity. We are working with technology providers. We have technology, but largely working with technology providers, scale them up to industrial scale, then engineering design the plant, and then implement it. And your clients are, uh, what, what, what industries or sectors are they coming from? Uh, chemicals. Uh, uh, other chemical value chain. So for starting from hydrogen, the basic molecule, uh, one hydrogen, one carbon, then building the hydrocarbon chain, uh, all the way to aviation fuels uh, or to polymers. Uh, that's uh, also handling uh, methane or, or renewable methane or handling those molecules, uh, ammonia or uh, transportation, storage, uh, utilization. So that's, Great. we touch all those uh, uh, entire value chain almost, but not end customer. We start, probably stop at uh, the 
monomer and, and then other uh, chemical plants as our chemical manufacturers are our clients or customers. Great, thank you. Mike? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jason, um, and thank you, JJ. Thank you, MIT, for um, hosting this phenomenal uh, collection of conversations and discussions around the role of technology. So I'm Mike Witt, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer at Northrop Grumman. Uh, Northrop Grumman, we sit in the aerospace and defense industry. We're a technology-focused company uh, whose mission is to protect national security and advance our understanding of the universe <coughs> while also delivering solutions to sustain it. So in my purview and my role as Chief Sustainability Officer, uh, I have the good fortune of working directly for our company CEO, Kathy Warden. And what I do in support of Kathy, our board, and uh, the 90 plus thousand who call Northrop Grumman home is that develop, will identify, uh, develop, and implement sustainable solutions all across um, our, the process of ideation to innovation to delivering a technology for the benefit of our customers. Um, our customer base is, uh, is pretty broad. We work, um, do a lot of work for the Department of Defense and all of our major services uh, in the military. Also, NASA and, and NOAA are two significant uh, customers of ours as well, in addition to doing work uh, in the international arena for a lot of our allies um, within and around the world. As it relates to sustainable <coughs> business opportunities, um, what I and my team have the good fortune of working on uh, in, in the company is taking an idea and then using, utilizing our technological expertise and figuring out a better way to deliver that idea uh, to our customer. Of course, those products need to hit and meet a certain level of performance, and that performance expectation is very high, and we're accustomed to hitting those expectations. But as our customer has become more adept at understanding, okay, this is what we want, but there's a different way we can do this, we need to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas footprint, and we need to um, think and, and, and collaborate and implement ways um, for us to demonstrate additional resilience given uh, changing climate. Um, there are uh, solutions that we are bringing to bear, again, in working collaboration uh, with our customers that, um, uh, that are, have taken us down paths that uh, I don't think would have been part of the conversation 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it's that, uh, it's that mission, again, working on and focusing on protecting uh, national security while also um, looking at innovative ways to do things differently so that we can jointly realize that sustainable future that we all deserve. Thank you. And, and I'll, just, I'll just call out one thing in what you said, which is that um, when, you're, when you said we'll deliver our customer solutions better, better meaning sustainable, that, that better has two facets that you kind of hinted at. One is a mitigation and one is an adaptation, right, in the sense that we, or, or resilience. So, so a, there's an aspect of this which is developing things that actually reduce our footprint, reduce waste, reduce uh, um, you know, emissions to the environment and so on, but also that are more resilient to the changes that we know are gonna come um, in, in the climate. And that, that resilience and that risk management, in a sense, are a key part of what, uh, Jerry, I imagine you do at, at working in an insurance company. Um, can you share a bit about where, where you sit at, uh, at Swiss Re? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, JJ. Uh, sorry, JJ. Thank you, Jason. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Swiss Re is a large reinsurer. Um, uh, you know, we touch you on a daily basis. Uh, you probably don't even realize it. So if you own a house, uh, chances are we are taking some of the risk. If you insure your car, chances are we insure some of the risk. And if you, at MIT, if you're building a building, chances are we insuring some of the risk, directly, indirectly. So very large company. Uh, we insure the insurer, so that's the business model. Um, our model is creating a more resilient world. We think, you know, creating a more resilient world means that you have to provide sustainable resources, and, and, and you know, we do it through data, through risk management, other, other uh, avenues, in order for societies to be resilient. Where I sit in the organization is, it's called the Swiss Re Institute. Uh, our mandate is to create innovative uh, products and solutions that we can take to the market. Uh, specifically, I am in the PNC function, which is property and casualty. And the way we uh, look at sustainability is through uh, better use of data for better risk analytics, uh, increased and better use of digitization to bring insurance uh, and other risk management solutions to the underserved uh, populations. 
Um, and and it's, it's a non-trivial task, and, and we can talk about that later as well. Great, great. And I, I, love, I love the cross-section here because, uh, again, in the, in the startup portfolio we saw before lunch, we saw chemical innovation, mechanical innovation, information technology innovation. Those are all kind of, we have a nice representation of those different pathways here. Um, we're going to start getting into now uh, really m mining the experience and expertise of the folks here. Um, when I run panels, I have a couple of kind of ground rules. Um, one is that you earn the right to tell a success story if you share a failure or a challenge story, okay? Because <laughs> um, we want to make it real. Sure. Um, and you earn the right to theorize and make general statements based on having told those stories so that we can stay grounded and we can really kind of build on the experience um, of, of the folks in the room. So I want to get some of those um, kind of stories out, out, out into, in, into the room. And the first part of this, again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand this process of getting technologies to the market, right? There's sort of a supply side of this, which is all those startups, and then there's like a demand side of this of, you know, what does the customer really want? What are they asking for? What are they willing to tolerate as far as uh, um, uh, commercial and technology risk? So let's start with that demand side. Um, wh what are you hearing from your customers um, that are having you build capabilities around sustainability? What are people really asking for and willing to, you know, take a little bit of risk or cost to, uh, to, to address? Um, let's get a little bit of that sort of context in the room, again, with some stories from your own markets. Yeah, I can go first. For the chemical industry that we are in, immersed in is the customers are more and more inclined to reduce their carbon footprint, right? Bigger companies uh, have a roadmap, or mid design companies also want to improve their energy efficiency or, or apply green energies, also the process improvement, also the feedstock diversify, uh, diversification. So those are a lot of sentiment, a lot of demand, um, but the challenge, we'll talk about challenge, but they have a lot of interest. Um, to utilize renewable feedstock, circular uh, feedstock, or uh, renewable energy, or uh, ways to reduce their energy cost um, on the plant. So would you, could you share an example of uh, a, a customer that came with that kind of demand for a technique? Yeah, for example, uh, ethylene cracker. Like ethylene is a fundamental chemical, make all everything we use. They want to, first of all, is there a way to to new way. Today it's using natural gas and cracked by a lot of steam, a lot of energy intensity. Mm -hmm. They want to know how to using <clears throat> green electron, electricity mm -hmm. to do cracking. Um, so we are working with partners to develop electrical crackers um, for the future, uh, for the future of ethylene, uh, to realize that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that kind of uh, ambition. Also, using hydrogen instead of uh, natural gas at the firing. So we have uh, uh, equipment, uh, proprietary uh, equipment called Earth, which is burns hydrogen uh, for the ethylene uh, plant or other chemical plant. And, uh, and, and again, w w maybe previewing some of this conversation about, about challenges, have, have you had situations where a customer said, hey, we're interested in this stuff, we want this, uh, you know, we want to do this with electrons, we want to do this with H2, we want to do this in a green way, and then when you start to show them the cost or the complexity or the risk, they sort of back off, or the next time they come to you, the functional requirements are a little different. I mean, how, how sort of stable and steady and reliable is that, is that demand from your perspective? I mean, energy, I'll, I'll uh, think about our chemical industry is downstream of energy, right? It, it influenced a lot by the oil cost or, or the, the cost of, of those uh, commodities. So like a couple of years ago, when we started energy transition, a company talking to chemical companies, they are lukewarm, right? It's costly, you will never have enough of uh, green electrons, so you will, uh, the, the cost will never make it now. Uh, the political landscape or, or geopolitical or because of conflicts in between um, Russian and Ukraine change, change the energy landscape. Mm. Now they are thinking about, okay, we need to have the ammonia, starting thinking about using ammonia as an uh, energy carrier uh, instead of uh, natural gas. 
so that suddenly ammonia cracking becomes interest. Right? Um, so that's uh, really, I was talking with the one of the company earlier, right? It's uh, very interesting. So, so uh, definitely uh, the, the cost overall, uh, the cost is very sensitive to customers. But also their awareness of this carbon uh, issue, um, the big challenge, change their mindset. That's very important. So any solution we provide need to be provide value, first or second, cost effective. We can always talk about green uh, to be sustainable, but if it's not really making uh, the economics, it's, it's just harder to, to industrialize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. What, what are you seeing in terms of the customer demand? I guess your customer is a, is a, B, it's a B to G environment. Correct. Right, a business to government. Yes. So um, what are you seeing there in terms of procurement mandates? And so because I want to remain to be on this panel and any future panels of yours, I will start with a challenge. Okay. Because it, it, is, it is a significant challenge in the line of work that we do. And again, Northrop Grumman, um, one of the major prime contractors uh, for the U.S. federal government, Department of Defense, NASA, NOAA, um, given the, the nature of the businesses um, that, that we employ at Northrop Grumman. And one of the challenges we have is in order to, it, it's a chicken and egg. It's a circular argument or, or conversation with, the, and it's also very collaborative because both sides understand this. And when I say both sides, when we talk to the Department of Defense, what I will say to my counterpart there is, Joe, in order for us to, to, to develop technology, we need an incentive, and typically a financial incentive for us to build that into our plan and then you know, put our uh, technological experts to work and then make something and then present it to you and say, hey, this is a solution to the challenge that you've articulated. And, um, and in order for us to do that, it needs to be built into the requirements because that's, again, that's the way our, our business works. And what Joe will very appropriately say is, well, okay, well, in order for us to build into the requirements, we need to know what to build into the requirements. So it's this conversation that tends to go in circles, but we're making progress. We're not there yet, but that is the challenge. And recognizing that as a challenge, one of what we're, what we're focused on is a, um, is a decades-long trusting relationship with the Department of Defense in this particular example. And, um, and we're both committed to getting to an endpoint where we will, they will help to define what that requirement looks like and we will help to, uh, them to understand what the possibilities are. And so that's the challenge. The opportunity space as it relates to the customers and maybe what's working well, <clears throat> our customer just last September published a, uh, the Department of Defense Climate Adaptation Plan. <clears throat> An outcome of that climate adaptation plan were all the services are, well, were and are to publish their climate action plans. The Army and the Navy have done this. For instance, in the Army Climate Action Plan, what they have said is by 2027, all non-tactical light-duty vehicles are going to be EVs. And you sit back and you think, by 2027, mm. five years from now, <clears throat> all non-tactical light-duty EVs, so I, I hope you're working with Ford and GM and you know, all those leaders in, in that space, you know, Tesla, Rivian, um, and they are. Uh, but, but in our space, they have also defined um, some areas where we can help them on the resiliency side. When we talk about resilience, they go back to 2018 when Hurricane Michael, aptly named, um, hit uh, the Florida coast and uh, really wreaked havoc in a large swath, including Tyndall Air Force Base. Of the $25 billion worth of damage that was done, $5 billion was, was uh, experienced right there at Tyndall. And so that really raised the level of awareness around the need for resiliency. And now the Air Force, and by extension the Department of Defense, is looking for partners to help make their entities more resilient. So on the resiliency side, focus, and then next generation technology. As a technology leader, we are looking for how it is we can deliver and exceed the performance expectations that our customers have while also doing it in a way that helps them and us to achieve our targets. We have a 2035 net zero target, and the U.S. government has a net zero target, and the, the departments and agencies, by extension, also have their targets. And so it's a joint, collab it's a collaboration focused around technology and really a commitment that, hey, we're going to figure this out together because it hasn't been done before. Two large entities, especially one as big as the Department of Defense, and, um, and it's impact on our, as Northrop Grumman and our industry's broader greenhouse gas emissions profile um, looks, there's significant opportunity for what that engagement can bring. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and it's, it's promising, and we, we believe we're going to deliver. It just is going to require um, additional conversation. 
One of the things I'm hearing in both Wei and Mike, what you said is that there is, the customer has a kind of primary mission parameter, which is they're trying to deliver something that is low cost, it's high performance, it's achieving mission readiness. And then there's the sustainability characteristics, which is that we want it to be low carbon, maybe resilient to climate change. And, um, and so there might be a sort of trade-off between those two dimensions or a perceived trade-off between those two dimensions. And part of what your job is is to say, here's why that doesn't have to be a trade-off. Or right, rather than see it as a one-dimensional this or that, you know, it's, a, it's two dimensions of performance. And we're going to break that trade-off for you and sort of push that frontier and say, here's something which is going to meet your cost requirements, going to meet your mission requirements, and deliver on sustainability. If, and, 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 but that's a dynamic, what I heard from you saying, Wei, is that that's a dynamic landscape. Because what counts as low cost, that pressure might be alleviated a little bit if all of a sudden oil prices and energy prices are much higher because of the Ukraine war. Um, so you're trying to break that trade off, but you're trying to do it as people's um, kind of needs and demands are changing. Um, the other thing that I, I just want to tease out in something that you said, Mike, is that um, you're talking to the Department of Defense. Department of Defense is thinking about you know, defense mission readiness and so on. There are other parts of the government that are thinking about climate resilience, greenhouse gas mitigation, et cetera, um, but they're not necessarily talking to each other. It hasn't necessarily been built into procurement requirements. And that's very similar from a corporate perspective, yes. I imagine, right? Is that it's one thing for the CEO of, a, of your customer to declare, we want to be net zero. It's a totally different thing for that to get embedded enough in the procurement organization that it's part of your, uh, your, your Trying to do that, yeah. functional it, it requirements. Is, yeah, it is a challenge. I think uh, also internally, uh, the company need to be or a concerted effort, right? To, we published our sustainable report that have to cascade down from the goal, right, and then to the management the process and to the construction site. Mm -hmm. not, only, not only the the emissions we do, but also customer scope two, scope three. So how also we want to to or kind of nudge the customer to the direction because we are helping them. We need to give them tools, and but also uh, Externally, how do we, uh, geographically is different. Um, some customer in, in, for example, Africa or North Africa, they, are, they need energy security. Um, how they want also to be sustainable, but how to really match that uh, kind of very complex situation that uh, come out a solution that fit for them, which is different from the solution for European customer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that embedding of sustainability into the site level requirements, even within the same corporation, might be different by region, depending on how feasible they think it is to implement those mandates. Right. Jerry, what, what are, when, when you're talking about, um, impl we're, we're talking about implementing new, essentially data analytics, AI type technologies to better assess and manage risk when we're talking about technology adoption within Swiss Re, that's partly driven by your own need to manage your risk and your operational costs, but are there things that your customers are asking for? Is there a demand side of this for you that's sort of pulling, uh, I don't know, support for more resilient and sustainable approaches in your, in your marketplace and the financial services? Yeah, I mean, so we are in the risk management business, right? So, well, not just risk management, right? We, we, we are in the risk business, right? It's about risk identification, risk assessment, <coughs> and then risk management, right? And at the end of the day, the underlying uh, or the foundational element for us to do that well is data, right? And, and so if you look at our customers, our customers are um, individuals like you and me, our customers are organizations like MIT, our customers are governments, right? So it's a really broad set of customers with different requirements. You know, no one comes to us and says, hey, I don't have a risk, but you know, we'll pay you money and just give us insurance, right? And then no one comes to us and says, hey, we, our risk is too high. Mm -hmm. So our job is to balance it and, and provide insurance at a price that's commensurate with the intrinsic risk, right? So if we overprice the risk, the customer loses. 
if we underprice the risk, we lose. The other challenge is, in a lot of situations, we price the price risk at point of time, and that risk materializes over 30, 40 years, right? So for example, in life, life policies. So data is the key, and so one of the challenges we always face is collecting the right data, accurate data, from our stakeholders, from our customers, in order for us to help them service, help service them better, right? So that's a really big challenge. And digitization is actually part of it, because, you know, like I said, it's about risk assessment, it's about, um, uh, uh, which, which includes risk pricing, and it's also about risk management. So to the extent we can get the right data, we can do all of those activities better. But also, when it comes to pricing, if we can digitize the experience, pricing is better. It makes insurance more affordable, right? And so I, I think there are more challenges than solutions in the market right now, mm -hmm. but insurance as an industry is rapidly embarking on a path of uh, analytics, uh, digitization, uh, IoT, uh, so on and so forth, to make the world more resilient. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, it's important what you said about making it affordable, right? Because if the only people who can afford to manage their risks are the people who can afford to manage their risk, right? right? Yeah. Then, then, we're gonna, then the risk is gonna fall to those who can't afford the insurance, who can't afford to sort of take some of these steps. And that's, that's another, when we're talking about sustainability-oriented innovation, there's one kind which is breaking those trade-offs with, 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 with performance characteristics, but breaking those, those trade-offs with cost is essential sometimes just to get into the market at all, but also to be able to reach a wider swath of people and get them included into these, into these solutions. Um, I want to talk a bit about the supply side so, uh, of, of this now, is the technologies. What, what are, um, one of the questions that's, that came through here in the pigeonhole is, what's the most disruptive technology that's being implemented in your industry? I'm interested to know, you know, what are the cool ideas and technologies that you have on your shelves that you're hoping to implement, um, but where, you know, maybe you've had some challenges in getting it to actually realize its potential. What's... What, is, um, what, what does that look like for you? I mean, you said that sometimes way that you're, you're bringing other people's technologies into an engineering project. But you have some, so are, do you have some favorite things that you've been wanting to get out there and build a plant? And one thing uh, is, uh, I want to mention is uh, circularity, right? Uh, how you recycle plastics or the materials. So we are very, uh, at the beginning, uh, we have our in-house technology, which is one brick of the whole uh, plastic making. If you think about plastic, right, you start with the uh, feedstock. Today it's fossil fuel. You make a monomers, uh, then you make a polymer, then in the end the product ends up into, for example, your shoes, right, um, or other, uh, your houseware. So we have technology can turn ethanol into ethylene, right? It's, it's ethylene is, is a building block to carbon. Ethanol two carbon, but ethylene have double bond can build other polymers. So uh, then, where the ethanol? So we are collaborating with uh, LenserJet. They can turn uh, CO two uh, or carbon monoxide, a fuel gas, out of steel mill into ethanol. Or, for example, uh, we have actually acquired technology turn uh, turn some uh, uh, corn like it's, we call it second generation ethanol right, from. Uh, from some wood stock, wood uh, mass or biomass mass into ethanol. So wherever you ethanol come from, we can turn that into ethylene. So I see that's a really interesting way to make a polymer chain. Uh, so from, from feedstock, um, variety of feedstock, it can be waste, gas, can be a, a kind of second gen, uh, the, the, uh, the biomass, waste, uh, kind of forest waste or agricultural waste turn into ethanol, and then we, we build, a, a build into ethylene, and the, then the rest of the, the, the polymer industry can make it to be polymer. So one interesting example I want to give you is, uh, uh, I see a change in the way we look at things, is if you notice last, uh, last week, last Friday, uh, On Shoes, a Swiss company that make shoe, running shoes. My sneakers. Yeah, I have one pair too. Yeah, I love it. So they, they, uh, they, they actually published the the ins the midsole, 
is made by EVA, which is a polymer, which have technology from, uh, uh, which utilize CO2 or CO recycled. Who was in it? So LenserJet, us, Technip Energy, and then BioRealis, right? BioRealis is making the polymer. So five years ago, or, or even a couple years ago, who would think, right? Uh, Technip Energy uh, with a fermentation company, with a polymer maker, with a brand name, a sports brand, to make that happen. So this, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's not, it's technology breaks, breaking really disrupt the, how the value chain works, um, or how people perceive, and like, I would never think about CO2, is in, I'm wearing a shoe, I'm capturing CO2, or storing it, right? Uh, it's just an example, and there are other more exciting examples. We work with uh, IBM on the cycle of the PET, which is bottle, plastic bottles, right? So from the supply side, people today, these are uh, recycled, they are pure, they're pure so you can make a food grade. But what about fabrics? There are a lot of like the, the, the skirt I wear, and there's a lot of uh, PET in there. They are colored, they have different challenges, uh, sometimes uh, because they're mixed uh, with, uh, with, uh, fa uh, with fiber, with e e plastic, and some of the fabrics, it's harder to extract or recycle. So we have technologies and in the development uh, with others. So it's, it's really a, a challenging that how do you make the whole chain work? Yes, and, and, a new, and new partnerships. I mean, kind of un, um, uh, unexpected alliances, in a sense, yes. like you said, across different sectors required to put those elements of circular together. And you've got to be able to build those partnerships, you've got to be able to find the right partners um, and build trust Presumably to get that to get that kind of work done. Yeah. yeah. Um, how about you, Mike? Is it cool cool tech that you've got uh, on the shelf? <clears throat> you want to see to for sustainability that we could. My eyes will light up when we uh, we can talk about technology in the in, in this realm as it relates to sustainable technologies of tomorrow. <clears throat> and I'm going to focus on one of our um, fastest growing businesses in Northrop Grumman space. And um, hopefully you all either heard of or maybe even got up really early here in the Eastern Time Zone on Christmas Day and you watched the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, started sending images back to us in, uh, in June. Uh, this was a long partnership that, uh, that we had with NASA. NASA now owns it, but we, uh, we, we built and developed the capability. And that's helping us to answer questions that we have today, the questions of tomorrow and the questions we can't even think of. Going back to my company's mission around advancing our understanding around the universe, I think that's the epitome of helping us to understand that. And so that's at a really high level. That sits out about a million miles. Let's uh, get a little bit closer to Earth. Our mission extension vehicles. And so um, we have a technology uh, that we've developed and we're utilizing that helps to prolong the life of a satellite. Um, as of right now, there's, depending on what you Google and to what source you go to, there's about 4,000 to 5,000 satellites um, of some uh, shape and size uh, that are uh, moving around the Earth right now. By the end of the century, and by the, I'm sorry, by the end of the decade, we're gonna have 40,000. Add another zero, <coughs> how many we're gonna have. And so there's an opportunity for us to better manage what goes up and how we can more sustainably provide a service to our customers. And so these mission extension vehicles will actually, they're, they're launched, um, they can actually acquire a satellite, they can, um, they can take the satellite and replenish it with fuel if that's what, uh, wants to, if that's what needs to be done. Um, or it can move that satellite to graveyard orbit and uh, move it out of the way of other satellite technologies that we want to uh, move at that orbit, uh, at, at that elevation. And so that's one that's a little closer to Earth. And now one that's you know, really, really close to Earth would be um, in, in the, I guess, in this space realm, and, and this is more along the line of a challenge, is, um, is propulsion. Propulsion is exceptionally energetic and requires, a, again, a lot of energy. And this is an area where um, we're working, again, collaboratively with our partners to better understand what are the, some of the options that we can move something from A to B quickly, effectively, efficiently, in a cost-wise fashion that's favorable, but also sustainably. And, um, and that's, again, another example of the collaboration where our products and our technologies are delivering the advances that our customers, in this case, NASA, NOAA are looking at. And then one final point um, on, on this um, point about NOAA. 
Um, we have, I believe NASA has launched nine Landsat satellites and, and we have had the good, uh, the privilege of manufacturing and delivering to NASA four of those, uh, the most recent of which was, which was launched a few months ago. These are capabilities that help us to understand the impacts of things like climate change. And so the, uh, the last Landsat satellite, again, helping us to understand um, uh, incidents of drought, um, helping us to better understand uh, sea ice loss, um, migration of, of uh, polar bears, and other things that um, our customer would find to be interesting and, and relevant. In addition to that, we're also helping to build our resiliency um, in situations where we have forest fires. And um, I actually read a, an article that was a summary of an interview that um, uh, an individual had with a collection of firefighters that were fighting forest fires out in the American West. And uh, the technology they have today relative to five years ago, being able to, with precision, uh, determine um, and predict where and how fires are gonna move so that one, they can address, they can fight the fires appropriately and effectively, but two, save the lives of the firefighters that are, that are putting themselves in danger by helping to protect us in uh, areas of higher population. So high level, mid level, mm -hmm. down to earth, um, opportunities and challenges. I tried to hit all. Yeah, no, no, appreciate it. Um, I wanna just double click on one thing. So yes. you said this, this mission um, rest extension vehicle, right? EVs, so, yep. so you've got this gadget flying up there, grabbing on the satellites, repairing them, remanufacturing them, upgrading them, releasing them back to the wild to go operate. Um, is that, so, so in a sense, it's kind of like a circular economy type of approach, mm -hmm. like, like, what, like what you were describing. I think about Patagonia saying, don't buy this jacket. Yes. You know, we'll repair the jacket if you send it in. Um, so you're, you're the zipper swapper um, good, for, good for space. Like, how is that going? Is that, is that, a, is that a booming business? Is it, is it, is it working? Well, it's our fastest, uh, the space is our fastest growing of our four businesses, and that's one of the components of our space business. Right. So yes, it's, um, uh, we, we, we have uh, favorable input from our customer, and um, we continue to build that business, in addition to many other capabilities that will help to develop more effectively, um, more effectively in a cost-wise fashion and in a safe, sustainable fashion, the, uh, the satellite-based technologies that our customers are looking for while prolonging uh, the life of those as well. You said sometimes you bring it to a graveyard orbit. Sometimes you do, or we have a customer that, hey, we don't need this capability anymore. It needs to be moved to a graveyard. We wouldn't make that decision. That would be a customer that would say, because you, yeah. you can't just grab onto whatever satellites you see. Mm -hmm. that'll, that'll cause challenges in the world. But um, when, when you do have that uh, relationship with a customer that seeks to have that type of service, this is the capability that can deliver that. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Um, I want to uh, take a second. I was watching the time here and make sure that we get some of the questions mm -hmm. from the audience. But Jerry, if, did you have any comments you wanted to add on this last theme? No, I, I think space risk is something we look at, right? And, and, and Mike mentioned uh, LEO 4000 satellites. I mean, it's already uninsurable uh, because uh, there's no mechanism for remediation, right? If satellite, dead satellite, satellite is out there, it could be this collision risk and so many risks. But I, I think, um, you know, as we talk about sustainability, in, in my view, we, we cannot ignore the effects of uh, sort of deglobalization and, and supply chain risk, right? Because a lot of the technologies we see have a very diverse uh, supply chain. And, and, and so when we look at solutions for the future, uh, from a risk point of view, it's important to understand, is the deployment of that technology sustainable? Mm -hmm. Are we sourcing it from a place? Are we sourcing the raw materials or inputs from a place where uh, we can continue to do so? Mm -hmm. Is the availability of the raw material um, uh, sustainable in the sense that is, is, is it going to be available 10, 20, 30 years uh, from now, given the consumptions? Um, We're talking about lithium, required. cobalt, nickel, lithium, rare earth. Well, you, lithium was exactly what I was yeah. alluding to. Right, right. So, I think it's important for us to not get too excited about just the technology component of it because, you know, and this is one thing I learned at MIT, which is it's all systems dynamic, right? One thing impacts the other. And if you focus on technology mm -hmm. without really understanding how the society consumes it, how the individual's lifestyle, you know, if, if, 
if your or my lifestyle doesn't change, mm -hmm. no matter what technology is out there, it's not going to uh, yes. you know, get us to 1.5. Yes. Right? In, in the prep call, we, we talked about uh, this idea of a, a TRL, a technology readiness level, that's often discussed in terms of the readiness of the technology to deploy. But we also talked about the commercial readiness level, right? How, how ready is the a market to adopt the necessary behavior changes? Um, how ready is the supply chain to be able to provide the ingredient uh, components and materials? Um, and those are things that some of these new approaches can run aground on as yeah, well. I, I think CRL and TRL take a little bit different approach, right? I mean, TRL is simply technology-based, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and we as an insurance company don't even typically come until you reach level of nine, right? And then commercial ready list level, again, it's scalability, but it, I don't think, in my view, the way, the way I've understood it, it, it takes that systems dynamic view of the entire supply chain, and and it's not just supply chain; it's it's deglobalization, right? We have to, we have to accept the fact that the the uh, the globalization wave has decelerated, if not reversed, at this point of time, right? It, it'll be uh, naive to assume that we can source anything from anywhere and use it on a continuous basis. I just don't think, I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's, I want to go to the questions here on, uh, on pigeonhole. Um, so, um, we've, we've, we, we, we touched a bit on this idea. One of the things that's coming up here a lot is this, again, this idea of trade-offs. Um, you know, how do you manage the tension between cost and sustainability? Um, how do you convince management to invest in projects that may not deliver the same shareholder returns? Um, you know, where are the trade-offs or the tensions? Like, wh wh what do these things run aground on? And, and where do we need to really change the way that we evaluate these projects in order to have them work within the normal kind of capitalist context? Uh, I think for the project, when we talk about, of course, customer has a need uh, of, it's a complex problem, first of all, to, to really acknowledge that. Uh, but like every, uh, the good thing is every company, the awareness is there after 10 years of efforts or every uh, non NGOs. Customers are uh, asking sustainable solutions well. We are putting um, some of the sustainable measures, like water usages uh, of the project itself, like water usage, CO2 emission, everything. But also uh, technology, uh, are some technology available today that has a lower carbon footprint. So we all putting all the together, um, definitely putting the calculation of the overall emission of carbon footprint of overall project. And then um, the capital, the investors, right? The, the big project usually have investors. Mm -hmm. Then to the shift in the investment world, right? A lot of people are investing in those uh, green projects. Uh, they are uh, in the long, long like their their kind of horizons are longer. Hmm. For example, uh, the the largest uh, so far the carbon capture sequestration project in UK Northern Sea, it's it's cost billions of dollars, right? There is multiple parties, uh, big big company the BP, Equinor, or, or like Technip uh, Energy are also in there and other uh, other investors, uh, overall developers are in there. So it's a complex problem that uh, requires multiple parties to be, be in it and manage the risk and make it profitable in the end or affordable. So I think as long as everybody play their part uh, to solve this puzzle, I think that's, that's a hope, right? Not only single company, uh, we were never able to do it, right? Or, or to, to do such a large scale and also seemingly a very costly project. So that's one, I don't know if it, that gives you a good right, answer, absolutely. but well, uh, I, that's I, one way to do it. What, what I like about that example is, like, as you said, the, the capital markets are playing a role, right? And, and, and you're saying, uh, we're going to do this physical project, maybe you're talking about carbon capture sequestration plant, There's, we're going to be going for, for working capital, you know, debt, project financing type mechanisms to banks and institutions, <clears throat> and they are they willing to provide a lower cost of capital because it's a green project? Yes. Okay. Yes, today, okay. yes. So that means that for some of these things, actually the terms of reference are changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think it's to require the whole uh, the chain, like uh, Jerry said. It's not only 
only the dev only the capital, the the financiers, they they are changing their mindset. The whole world is changing, so it's a really require a concerted effort. Mm -hmm. Mike, you had a comment on that? <clears throat> Very quickly, because I want to make sure Jerry has a chance before our time uh, ends up. On this topic, I think it's really important to convey that when we look at beauty's in the eye of the beholder. So one stakeholder might look at this as a, oh, it's all about cost. And sustainability shouldn't be part of the conversation. We have multiple stakeholders, all of us up here, in fact, all of you. And in our space, I kind of distill it down to three primary stakeholders. We have our investors, we have our customers, and we have our employees. And so when we look at the products, the technology that we develop through those three lenses, while it might be a cost versus sustainability from one perspective, it might be a cost and sustainability from another. And what do I mean by that? We, as a technology leader, if we're going to attract the best and the brightest from universities like MIT, we have to do it right. And if we're not doing it right, meaning if we don't put our best foot forward, we aren't developing technologies in a way that minimizes the, if not eliminates the impact on the environment, helps our customer to be the most sustainable and helps our, the, the employees they call Northrop Grumman home to bring their whole selves to work and to be able to explore ideas and the whole social component of exploring a career. If we don't get that right, we're not gonna attract the best and the brightest employees. And then on the investor side, all you gotta do is look at you know, Larry Fink at BlackRock and many others like Mr. Fink, who through his, through his uh, CEO letter at the end of, or beginning of each year, has there's been a steady uh, uh, drumbeat and an upswing on the importance of ESG and the decisions that large institutional investors like BlackRock and many others are making. So I'll stop because I want Jerry to have a chance to respond. Thanks. No, I mean, I agree with uh, both of you, right? I, I think uh, we, we have to look at sustainability from, from the climate piece of it, societal resilience piece of it, and the individual resilience piece of it, right? You cannot look at it in isolation. And I think, yes, we are seeing ESG being priced uh, in a certain way where, where investors are willing to take a discount, but that's not sustainable. I mean, we talk about sustainability, it has to be long term. And so if sustainable, sustainability initiatives don't provide, uh, uh, so, so you can't have a long term view where ESG or sustainable initiatives uh, don't have to play on the level playing field where we'll keep discounting them. That's not gonna happen in the long term, right? I mean, we're looking at a economic situation globally where that kind of subsidy or discounting is not gonna happen for too long, right? And so we need to make sure that A, the technology is right. So we talked about carbon sequestration, and again, there was an article by one of the professors at MIT in New York Times, mm -hmm. so that's a technology that's up for discussion. Uh, but I think we, we cannot look at sustainability without taking a systems dynamic view. We're looking at the whole integrated society, individual, organizations, earth, all combined. Amen. Great, I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great note, note to close on. Um, I mean, what, one, of the, one of the key themes here I'm hearing is that there is a certain amount that we can do as individual companies, but there are certain aspects of this which is about systems change, right? It's about, the, it's about what the investors are willing to tolerate, it's about what kind of companies are willing to come together for circular solutions. Um, it's about what we can do in terms of changing consumer and customer behavior, and that's going to require more conversations like this, more conversations like this whole conference, um, and really uh, gr grateful for the role that you've each played in, in moving that conversation forward. So thank you. A pleasure. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason.